Please stop all this woke agenda. It's political correctness gone mad. Sorry, thought police. You're such a snowflake. Surely all lives matter. Ah, oh, did those sound familiar? Here on You Can't Say Anything Anymore, we unpack the nuances of these comments and bring sidelined lived experiences to the forefront. Brought to you by Diversifying Group. Everyone, welcome to this month's podcast. I'm your host, Naomi, and my pronouns are she, they. And this month, we have a very special guest. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rudy Lowe. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a visual artist and uh, currently a PhD student at the University of Arts London. Great. Thank you so much. It's great to have you on the podcast this month. Uh, so tell us a bit more about what projects you're focusing on with your PhD. You know, why did this interest you? All of those things. Yeah, so my PhD is a practice-based PhD, which means that um, my painting and my drawing is the research that I'm doing. And I'm looking at some, um, well, I'm basically looking at Britain's response to black power organizing in the English speaking Caribbean um, during 1960s and the 1970s. And to do that, I'm using some records from the National Archives um, in the UK that were recently declassified. Um, and so, yeah, this is like a history that hasn't really been widely discussed, at least in the UK. Um, I mean, obviously, it's something that's known about in the English speaking Caribbean, but it's not something that you know, gets platformed, say, like in the curriculum or um, kind of like in the discussion around how Britain, um, the withdrawal process from, from the Caribbean um, during like when countries were gaining independence. And so especially kind of in the last few years, how there's been definitely much more of a, a drive to address colonial legacies. And this is kind of an aspect of that kind of understanding um, what role Britain played in how black power movements were able to organize in the English speaking Caribbean. So that's kind of my main, my main project at the moment. And then alongside that, um, yeah, I'm doing other projects. So my collaborator, Jacob D. Joyce, we have been um, artists in residence at the Serpentine Gallery in 2021. And we created um, this power pack around the climate emergency, looking at young climate activists across the world, um, in particular kind of black indigenous people of color who were making changes in their community. And so building on that, um, we're kind of doing the next iteration of the power pack this summer, working with a young activist to kind of create a second power pack. So I kind of work on lots of, um, yeah, smaller projects as well, but the, the main project that I'm working on at the moment is definitely the PhD. Yeah, so topical, obviously right now when we're recording on the hottest day of the year um, <laughs> and things, but yeah, that's a super interesting. I don't know if um, if you could just give a little bit of a summary, summary for our listeners. I just had a thought actually that um, for anybody that sort of doesn't know about in the context about sort of Britain's involvement with the Caribbean or things, it's only sort of um, kind of top, top, top down kind of uh, little summary that you could give us just in case anybody doesn't know the context behind that. Uh, sure, yeah. So I guess I would say that, um, so during the 1960s, I mean, even sort of before that, there was like some decades um, of anti-colonial resistance. So whilst, you know, places like Jamaica, Trinidad, um, Bermuda, Barbados were still British territories, which meant that they were still British colonies, um, there were anti-colonial uh, resistance movements, you know, fighting for independence. And so kind of from the 1960s, we start to see much more of a move towards independence. So, you know, Jamaica and Trinidad, they got independence in uh, 1962. And so um, Barbados, I think, was shortly after that. Um, and so there was started to be this shift towards independence, or at least starting to think about what independence would look like um, in those islands. And at the same time, you know, we see black power movements starting to uh, really spread across North America, across 
you know, the UK um, and also, you know, in Africa, the same thing was happening, different kinds of anti-colonial movements and kind of moving towards independence. So it's really important to understand that although this research that I'm looking at is focused on the English speaking Caribbean, it's part of a much wider network of movements that were taking place simultaneously. And it's not like they're separate from each other, you know, they overlap. So there are people who were involved in um, movements in the Caribbean who were also involved in Africa, in North America, in the UK. And so I think that, you know, Britain was really aware of how this could spread, you know, that what they would call black power ideology, um, you know, spreading to different parts of the world. And also the fact that there was a potential for activists to also align with communism, um, which was another thing that they were trying to fight at the same time. So I think that was a fear for them that there was this threat, you know, the black power threat, the communist threat for them, and that somehow, you know, um, solidarities would be built between Cuban our uh, Soviet Union um, c communist uh, nations and organizations with black power uh, org organizations as well. So, um, so they were taking concerted efforts basically. And so, yeah, um, depending on whether a, a country in the Caribbean had already gained independence, then they were or weren't able to take certain levels of action. So for example, Bermuda is still a British territory to this day. Um, so the actions that they were able to take in Bermuda were far more severe than say in Trinidad where they had already gained independence in 62. So you can kind of see um, the archives, you know, and these are the, these archives, the national archives, are the archives of the government. The National Archives are the state archives. They're from different government departments. So you get to see the sort of inner workings um, of these government departments, the conversations that they were having with each other about this. And so you got, you kind of, there's a, just, it's very explicit basically that you can see the operations that they were taking. So for example, um, in 1969, when uh, Paulo Fago initiated the first regional Black Power Conference in Bermuda, um, the British government sent a frigate, they sent a warship and marines to Bermuda, um, you know, because of this conference. And so, you know, the archives are able to show us those sort of extreme actions that they were taking, just the real level that they uh, perceived like the level of threat that they perceive black power to be what what does it mean to engage with these archives that you know chronicle black history black power specifically and you know I guess um on an individual level and on a societal level yeah I guess it feels important to say that there are different kinds of archives so like I said the national archives are the state archives they are the archives of government departments of the British government. Um, and this also includes um, some of the colonial records. So um, it's, a, it's quite a, a bigger history, but basically when um, independence started to happen, um, there's this whole history around what happened to the records. And so we now know that, um, you know, millions potentially of records were burnt um, when, uh, they were leaving countries, you know, because the records were so damning. They were so, um, you know, they, the fact that they showed the actions that they'd been taking were so atrocious that, you know, loads of these records were burned. Um, but some of the records that weren't burned were sent to a secret government archive um, called Hanslope Park. And around, I think it's 2013, basically, um, the Mau Mau in Kenya brought a case against uh, the British government for um, the for being tortured basically. And no one had ever been able to get into this archive because basically, yeah, it was like a secret archive and, you know, his historians, journalists, no one could get into it. Um, and the only, the only thing was if you had a number of a record, then you would be able to access that single record. But obviously no one had a number because no one had been in there. Um, so basically because of this court case, um, 
it became law that those records needed to be moved to the National Archives and those are called the Migrated Archives. But I think it's important, the reason I mention that is that it's important to understand that these records, these archives, these are like, these are very violent records in some cases, you know, that, um, yeah, that are written by the government. They're written from a particular perspective. So when black people, are in those archives, it's from a particular perspective, you know, and that for me is really important to understand that there is black history in the National Archives, but it's not black people talking about black history. It's the, it's the British government talking about these individuals. So, you know, these individuals are only in the archive when they become relevant to a government department in some way, you know, whether that's special branch, which is like uh, part of the police, um, whether it's the information research department, which is the uh, one of the departments that I'm looking at, which was the British government's secret propaganda unit, uh, which is part of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. So yeah, it's like a very particular kind of black history that enters those records where it kind of, in opposition to that, community archives, you know, which are created by the community, potentially for the community, you'll find very different kinds of perspectives or materials in those kinds of archives. So for example, um, the Huntley archives, which is based at London Metropolitan Archives. This is the archive of Eric and Jessica Huntley. Um, so they started a bookshop and publishing house um, called Bogolovica uh, and the Walter Rodney Bookshop. And yeah, they were basically community um, organizers and activists um, from Guyana who moved here and yeah, set up this publishing house and bookshop and were doing loads of different kinds of organizing and really important figures in, in, uh, in black history basically. And so yeah, their archives now are at LMA and you can look at those. And so, you know, you really have these very, very different um, kinds of histories present basically. Um, or for example, the Ruckus archive, which is a black LGBT archive also at LMA. Um, so I feel like it's important to know that there are these kind of different kinds of archives and that um, who has made the record, you know, who has gathered the material, why is it here, is also important when we're thinking about it, because when I look at the records from the National Archives, um, I can't take them at face value. So in terms of being a researcher, I have to read them against the grain, which means that I have to kind of read them with a critical eye, that I can't just assume that um, the way that the British government are talking about these individuals is completely true and accurate, you know, that I have to understand that um, there was an agenda with why this material was being collected. Um, and, and at the same time, there are examples of um, like ephemera, you know, whether that's like newspapers, newsletters, um, flyers, things that maybe otherwise would have been lost that are gathered by them um, as part of their surveillance. So another really good example of this is um, there were a series of photographs taken from the mangrove protests, which happened in the 1970s. So um, it's actually kind of become more widely spoken about now because Steve McQueen did um, an episode in his Small Axe series um, about the mangrove protest. And those photos, which I think were probably used as research for the Small Axe episode, um, were taken by the police. So it's like one of those things where it's like, okay, we have these photographs of the protest, which can be used in a critical way to highlight this really important black history. And at the same time, they were taken originally as part of surveillance, you know. So, yeah, I just think that's that's really important that when we think about how we use archives, um, you know, we need to always have this criticality present in how we're looking at the material and, and thinking about why it's there in the first place. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I think that's so interesting, I guess, as a sort of a lay person hearing about these things. It's, you know, as you as you mentioned it's it's about who it's for 
who it's by. And I guess, you know, accessibility comes into it as well. The National Archives, I guess, are the ones that I'm, I'm guessing would be widely available for a lot of people. And you're saying that if it's from a particular perspective from and talking about people in a way that that they are voiceless and they have no kind of agency over how they're spoken about, you know, and yet this is something that's widely accessible for everybody and things. And yet other ones you think about community um, based archives that um, perhaps they're not, perhaps they're not as widely known by people and things, but they're not people sort of um, might not know the difference between how different archives are and how important it is that the different sort of um, creation and the sort of from its inception, um, how um who it's created by um yeah um i think thank you that's a really important point to mention about accessibility actually because even though you know the national archives for example are a public institution and technically anyone can go there and do some research um they are still a very inaccessible space in a lot of ways you know you have to you have to physically go to queue to look at a lot of the records. Um, you have to have a membership card. You know, you need to have certain documents to get a membership card. You need to understand the codes of how the space works, you know. And then even when you're in that space, you might experience microaggressions. And so, you know, for me as a researcher, now that I have been working in archives um, for such a long time, so within my work, I have like facilitate as an artist I facilitated workshops um, using archives for creative practice I've also been an archive assistant so I'm now in a position to feel um, fairly comfortable to you know to hold space in that environment if I experience a microaggression it might be annoying but it's not going to be something that's going to be like right I can never come back here you know whereas I think for a lot of people um this is such an alien space they probably don't know that it exists they probably don't know that they're allowed to go there and even then when they get there you know you have to there's just there's just so many codes that you have to understand that are that's going to make it inaccessible to a lot of people um and so yeah it's one of those things where it's like the history is there, but then who is actually looking at it? And, you know, in terms of like digitization, I think that people maybe assume that a lot of the records would be digital, but actually it's, that's just not the case. You know, like the National Archives have, I think it's like 12 million records. Like that's just not gonna happen. I don't think even all of them are catalogued. Um, so, and the records that I'm looking at were once like top secret government um records you know so they're never going to be digitized like it's not in the british government's interest uh to digitize those records and actually um a lot of them have been redacted so so um i mentioned the migrated archives earlier something that happened with the migrated archives was that i was listening to this npr podcast and they were saying that um old like basically retired officials are being hired to redact the files as they're being migrated over to the National Archives. So they're taking out bits of information. Um, so that history, you know, is still being erased as it's coming. Um, and so, you know, the idea that the history is just there and available actually, but there are parts that we're never gonna be able to see. And they were saying that that whole process um, of redacting and migrating them over is gonna take 350 years which is just like, you know, it just, it really like speaks to the levels of, of suppressing the history. And I think that sometimes people talk about hidden histories, but I think that that doesn't really account for the level of responsibility. And actually it's not hidden, it's like suppressed, you know, that something is being suppressed here. So um, with the records that I'm looking at from the information research department, as I said, they've been redacted and you can make a freedom of information request, um, which means, you know, you put in a request to have access to the document, um, the parts which have been taken out. So in some cases, I'm not sure if that's possible where they've just like redacted lines. But um, sometimes what they do is they remove like a page or a part of the document or a whole document and the government department keeps it. And so you can make requests to gain access to that. So for example, I made a request 
to look at a document from like 1970, you know? So we're talking like a 52 year old document um, and it was denied. And the reason it was denied was because they said it was a threat to national security um, for that to be looked at, you know? So then it makes you think, okay, but what's in that, that document? You know, why after 52 years is that still gonna be an issue for national security? Um, so there is an active suppressing in trying to, you know, not make this or make not make parts of this history visible. Uh, that's so interesting. Thank you so much again for uh, sort of explaining. I think you know um, many people listening and myself. I, I didn't realize that they weren't digitized. I think you know, as you mentioned, that's probably a very common misconception. And just you know, talking through these sort of levels of <laughs> inaccessibility of, of gaining this information. And um, yeah, that document is so interesting. I think. I can imagine I would be thinking, well, what is what's really in there then? And just the kind of pushback that you were explaining about all of these uncovering the history. I mean, 350 years is just ridiculous, isn't it? And it's like what I just, I just think, you know, where do we go from there? Like, you know, it's just wild. It's just completely wild. Like they've got millions of records, you know, um, I can't remember it. Like, I don't know why, but they measure the, the records which are coming from the migrated archives. They measure them in feet. I don't know why, but they were like, you know, it's like, a, there's like, there's just millions of records there. And, and all of this is being suppressed and it's over 37 countries um, that, that Britain colonized that, that they've got documents from, you know, in that archive. Um, and you just think like, you really are trying so hard to make sure that no one gets to, to see this really. So much for an open book kind of, oh, we, we all have culpability about this and don't worry, we talk about it all the time. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? I just think that, you know, I really liked your point you mentioned about how it's not just a case of um, even once you get in the door to be able to see it. And as you mentioned, but, you know, with your experience and things, there's still many, many barriers, many challenges. And then even beyond there, having to get to request to see, to see documents. I mean, there just seems to be so many levels to these things and like you said just they're really trying to stop people from having the sort of uh, knowledge to know about these things and I guess really in a way it kind of um, deforms the sort of next generation from understanding and truly learning about these things um, yeah. yeah that's I mean that's why I'm doing this work so my work as an artist sort of my my method my process is that I look at these records in the archive I photograph them all like I've you know I photograph every page of every record I look at and part of that is because the, the access issue you know that maybe like I can't go there every day um, or when I want to you know I've got to go in there in their open hours um, but also I think I've had a bit of a fear that they would um, close the records again so you know when they're closed it means you're not allowed they're not accessible um, so they're have been other examples of records that have been opened and then closed again and so I was really scared about this happening so I was like well I'm gonna have a copy in any case so you know I photographed everything that I've looked at um, but then you know my kind of my thinking is yeah how can I take these mostly text-based documents um, which are like partly written um, in typewriter, but also partly written by hand. You know, you have officials writing to each other um, by hand on the paper. Some of their handwriting is like completely illegible. Um, you know, like, I don't think you wanted anyone else to be able to read this. Um, but so my job is kind of figuring out all of this information and kind of finding a way to put it together and into a way um, translating it into painting and drawing. And so, you know, trying to find a way to take that history out of the archive and into another space and hopefully, hopefully, you know, make it more accessible to some people or at least sort of like pique their interest so that they might go and then find out more about the history. Um, I should also mention that there are people who have done, you know, some of this research already. So um, there is a scholar called Keto Swan who has written an amazing book called 
um, Black Power in Bermuda. And so that's like just specifically looking at the Black Power movement in Bermuda. Um, there's another book called uh, Black Power in the Caribbean, edited by uh, Kate Quinn. And um, that's kind of different um, writers looking at different parts of the region. But I think that what was really interesting for me was the fact that the records that come from the information research department have only started to be released from 2019. So these are records which are by and large, you know, haven't really been researched. So there's parts of the history that has already been in some way narrated, but there is another part of the history that hasn't. And that's kind of where I want to be like, okay, so what has been told and what hasn't been told and yeah what can I kind of build on so it's not I'm not um I don't want to say like I'm the first by no means like there are loads of people who have been doing this work already but I want to like tap into that um lineage and find a way to kind of carry on okay so yes one was writing about this and actually now we know this is also what they were doing you know in terms of like putting propaganda out about black power activists and having solid examples of the propaganda that they were putting out and kind of yeah thinking about okay so how does artistic practice fit into this um what can painting and drawing potentially do as a way of um participating in the dialogue i, I absolutely love that the fact that you know you're talking about the transformation from these as you mentioned, old, inaccessible, sometimes illegible texts, and bringing it into something that could be more accessible and could be more, uh, could potentially, um, as you mentioned, continue the dialogue, continue the thought train, bring it to, to new people, and bring it to people that aren't even directly affected by that. I'm sure that you know that's it's, it's very. I, I just love that idea about the transformation from there, and just um, the fact that you mentioned obviously lots of other people doing this as well. I think it's it's just something. Um, how to say, um, something very powerful in, uh, I guess, continuing the voice. Um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I just like, one other thing I want to say is that I feel like, I mean, the reason why I started doing this work in the first place was actually because I was looking at what was happening now with um, Black Lives Matter and the sort of government reaction to Black Lives Matter. And I think on some level, I just was like, this is not the first time that this has happened. I know from doing, you know, bits and pieces of research, like using the Huntley archives, um, I know that there has been um, what, there's a, there's a great uh, writer called uh, Ronaldo Walcott and he calls it the interdictions, which is sort of like the way that um, blackness is prohibited, you know, that we're not allowed to sort of have autonomy over our, our existence. Um, there have been these pushbacks against black resistance movements throughout history. Um, and so I was, what I really wanted to, sh to show was that there is, there is a link between what's happening right now and what was happening at this moment in the Caribbean. Um, and I think as someone who's from the Caribbean diaspora as well, that that felt important for me that it's like wait our whole lives um for those of us who are from the caribbean diaspora our whole lives have been transformed in some way um by the british government's in involvement in these movements um and some of the tactics that they were using with black power um, organizers and activists at that time mirror some of the things that they're doing now um, and also, like, in 2020, they uh, released this guidance, which was, I don't understand why it's, like, part of this particular guidance, but it was, like, plan your um, relationship and sex education guidance. And somehow um, they basically managed to slot in there something about not promoting victim narratives um, not having groups such as Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion coming to talk or, uh, you know, promoting these kind of groups in schools. Um, yeah, uh, not talking about uh, anti-capitalism. And so they managed to kind of slide in these changes 
in a document that maybe people wouldn't have known to look in. And, and luckily, you know, there was um, a pushback by teachers. There's a group called CARE, which I can't remember, it, um, Coalition of Anti-Racist Educators, I think it's called, who were pushing back against this document, which is really important that, you know, that people do that. Um, but yeah, so it made it harder, you know, for people to talk about um, BLM, for example, in schools. And there's a reason why there's a reason why the government doesn't want, um, you know, students to engage with BLM. And when you look at some of those records, for example, a record which comes out of Jamaica, um, you can see exactly the same conversation happening around wanting to make sure that um, students are not like radicalized in any way. And so it's really interesting to kind of be like, this is not new. You know, this is something that, that has been happening for a really long time and kind of connecting those dots for people. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if it's, <laughs> oh dear, students not, not wanting students to connect with BLM. I mean, oh dear. <laughs> Sorry, as a, as a human, just a moment, then I just had a little bit of a, oh dear. Anyways, um, yes. I think, oh, I, I mean, in a way, is it sort of, I can imagine it It would be equally frustrating as potentially a little bit cathartic as well to understand that the times that we're going through have been shared by many people, but at the same time, deep, deep frustration to know that these things are not only hidden through history and inaccessible to a lot of people, but also the fact that they are continuing to this day, um, and, and, you know, all of these things. Yeah, I think it's hard because in some ways it can be really disheartening to feel like what has changed, you know? Okay. Um, yeah, to think, okay, so these are the same tactics that you were using 50 years ago that you're still using today. Um, that feels disheartening. And I think that in some of these records, there's a level of violence that is hard to it's really hard to sit with, you know, I think as, as a black person as well, it's like, it's hard sometimes to read um, that, you know, you're taking a lot of it in, but at the same time, I think for me, it's like balancing that with looking at the ways that people, black, the ways that black people were pushing back against this, um, that, you know, there was, people were still organizing in the face of these things happening, um, that, that for me is sort of the kernel that like really keeps me going that um, no matter the level of suppression um, and oppression that people, black people were experiencing, there was still always resistance movements. And so, you know, even if you go back um, to the times of slavery and looking at uh, plantations in the Caribbean, there were always resistance movements. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just abolition, white abolitionists, for example, who were coming in as saviors. Um, there were always people who were enslaved who were part of those resistance movements. So I think for me, that's very encouraging. Um, I think that regardless of these changes that might be made, for, you know, to, uh, to education, it's, it's really important that we find ways to continue to have these conversations, to share the knowledge, to organize, to push back. And for me, it's like, I think just knowing the history is one element of that. Um, it's not necessarily a way to create a roadmap, but it's just useful information to see how people were organizing in the past. Um, what tactics maybe worked, what tactics maybe didn't, you know, just just knowing how people were able to come together. And obviously, like, we're living in a different time now, um, technology, you know, even, yeah, climate justice, um, you know, different kind of intersections of issues that are coming together. But I think that it's just useful to have all of that knowledge, to have as much knowledge um, as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I completely hear that, as you mentioned, it's the as much as not sorry as much knowledge as possible but also the deep kind of uh, i guess as you mentioned yeah deep disappointment and deep kind of cycle of frustration of the continuation of these issues um even though as you mentioned that nowadays it's different intersectionalities 
lots of other issues as well, but sort of the continuation of really the core issue. Um, and I liked as well that you mentioned about the fact that what keeps you going is the sort of, um, how to say, um, am I right in saying sort of the potentially pride or the potential sort of um, the connection with the people that always push back, that always resisted, that sort of continue that? Is, is, is Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, yeah. I think it's just like, just the knowing that that is still within us, you know, that there is a resilience. I mean, I use that word carefully, actually, because I think that um, resilience is something that sometimes is used against Black people in a way. Um, but I also think that there is a power in in the, the resilience that we can embody, that, um, you know, that we are maybe holding grief and pain and trauma and at the same time are like still pushing forward and you know kind of finding this these like little ravines you know different modes and ways to try and um continue just fighting against these these systems that were never that were never made for us and at times were actively made against us Yes, absolutely. I think that um, I'm guessing what from what I understand from what you're saying is that sometimes the word resistance can be used to remove people's vulnerability and people's ability, like you said, to hold different aspects such as grief, such as sadness and rights to feel that, um, even though that's completely justified. Um, but in a sense, from what I hear you saying is about the, I guess, I guess it speaks to the sort of, how to say, the superpower if you will of the community of those people um to hold all of those things together but also to continue and progress and um continue to sort of um i guess do their bit um in times of difficulties and times of, even though as you said it those things were called upon them in times when you know specific laws and legislations were made when only certain people had any kind of freedom or any kind of say in certain things yeah I guess I would say like we only have each other you know um in terms of looking at like what was happening with this particular history you know black power organizers would not have had the same level of resources as the British government um and that could be said the exactly the same thing now that, you know, uh, black resistance movements now um, and other resistance movements now, you know, whether it's like trans resistance movements don't have the same level um, of resources against what we're fighting. You know, we're fighting for liberation um, against, you know, people who, who would like to oppress us, uh, who are very well resourced. And so you know, in the face of that, we have each other. And I think that that feels like the important thing to recognize that um, when we kind of get swept up in individualism, um, the, the sort of danger in that is that, you know, we're not able to kind of really support each other. And that's been one of the things that has been interesting um, in some way about the pandemic is that there are people who have engaged with sort of um, different kind of modes of community care, such as like mutual aid, that probably never knew about those things before and, or never really engaged with that. And so, yeah, we've shown that there are, there is a sort of willingness to, to sort of be there for each other and take care of each other. And that's really like the most important thing to sort of prioritize that we, as communities, are able to kind of come together and make sure that we are continuing to show up for each other. Yeah, I guess that would be one of my other questions was about what steps people can take to acknowledge, surface and highlight this sort of this black history in their, in their own lives. Because I've mentioned that people are becoming more engaged with the projects, but are there any other things that you'd have to say about it? Yeah, I guess like one of the most important things is that people don't think that black history is only relevant to black people. You know, I think that like the creation of uh, Black History Month, it's like, great, I'm really glad that there um, is an opportunity for people to learn about black history. And at the same time, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the only person who would say this. There are loads of people that would say like, I don't want us to only know about black history in October. I want people to learn about it all year round and understand that it's relevant all year round. You know, um, I want us to sort of recognize the fact that black history is not just about black people. You know, when we talk about whether it's the transatlantic slave trade, that's, you know, actually like, um, I was having a conversation with someone recently about the fact that the slave trade is part of uh, British heritage and actually like we need to recognize that as British heritage that's not just black history that's the history of Britain um, regardless of whether it was taking place here or in the Caribbean that's also part of British history so I think that there needs to be a level of ownership or um, responsibility and recognition um, of how people can engage with black history, um, that it shouldn't be like, oh, this doesn't concern me or it's not relevant to me, so I don't need to know about it. You know, that we should actually be trying to learn about uh, those histories, even if we don't think that it's part of our own history in some way. Um, and the other thing is, I think that there are people who have roles who can also uh, take it upon themselves or take responsibility to do that work. You know, for example, teachers, um, you know, whether you're a parent, a librarian, you know, people who have some sort of pastoral role have a position where they can actually um, take responsibility for that as well. So, you know, um, yeah, I've had conversations in the past about um, with people about when to learn about these sorts of things, like what age range is like acceptable in some way to learn about this. But for a lot of black children, they don't get a choice whether or not they kind of learn about some of these things. It's sort of embedded in your experience. There's no, there's no sort of shield for black children. So I don't really see why there should be a shield for anyone else. Um, so I feel like, yeah, you know, parents, for example, can really take it upon themselves to make sure that they're teaching their children about, um, about these histories, regardless of whether they're learning about it in school. You know, teachers can take it upon themselves. Um, librarians can take it upon themselves to make sure that the, you know, the books in the library um, are reflecting these histories. You know, I, I, I used to work in a library as a library assistant, and I was always trying to, you know, look at, I would look at all of our collections and, you know, really try and think about, okay, what do we actually have here and what is missing? And I would constantly be like, we need this book, you know, and that's what they should be doing, that, that you know, rather than just kind of be a, um, a passive steward that people need to be taking an active role in making sure um, that these are these histories are being platformed um, and not just the transatlantic slave trade because I think that also the other thing that happens is that people become comfortable with certain kinds of narratives and we need to be critical and questioning why are people comfortable with learning about particular histories and particular places and particular people who have in some way become palatable and who are the people that maybe feel a bit, they maybe feel a bit more complicated about or maybe there's a certain messiness um, or it feels like the proximity is closer, you know, and actually be unraveling that more that, you know, history is not something that we can just tie up in this neat bow um, it's messy and it's also always subjective you know there is no version of history that is not subjective and so um, yeah allow that sort of messiness to come in and the other thing that feels important to say is that um, a lot of cultures have oral histories and so we need to be critical of thinking about who is telling the history who are our sources um, you know, there are some historians, for example, David Starkey, who are very violent. Um, you know, the things that he has said are very violent. And so I would be extremely critical of any version of history that he's written because I've, I've heard his bias, you know, in the way that he talks about black people. Um, so I think that, you know, we need to have that criticality and think about who is telling that history 
where is it coming from and also where are those other versions of history how can we tap into those so for example um, places like the British Library have collections of oral histories you know so we can't just rely on one form of of, of like ways of accessing the history we need to have different modes and different um yeah just different ways of engaging yeah absolutely I, I love that you mentioned about the I guess the passivity and the way that um really sort of truly engaging and truly kind of um you know your example about the library sort of it's not just okay just to say okay well we've got a few authors they're on the shelf in October that's fine <laughs> I think that it's about sort of I guess what you're speaking to is the sort of wider pushing and kind of continual process of learning, continual process of unlearning lots of things, um, but also learning and taking on more perspectives. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned about the, you know, about the narratives, how sometimes they become so fixed and so stale. And um, sometimes, as you mentioned, that certain ones can become more palatable, more acceptable and more widely spoken about and given more voice. And yet other ones are not. And then when we only get draw a narrative from one place, you know, when the information becomes very biased towards those specific things, and lots of other things are, are missed out. So, yeah, so uh, just before we close, I'm really uh, interested to hear more about sort of the influences that Caribbean folklore have had on your works. I know that we mentioned it before in our sort of pre-interview. Um, so yeah, if you could just speak a bit about that. Yeah, so um, I guess since maybe 2019, I've been working um, with, the story of Anansi. So for people who don't know, Anansi is uh, this figure in African, like West African and uh, Caribbean folklore. And he's kind of thought of to be this trickster. So Anansi is a spider and can also transform into a man. Um, and yeah, he's kind of, people talk about him being this sort of lazy trickster, you know, um, who always wants to kind of like get out of having to work. He's always like underestimated in some way. And this was really interesting to me, trying to think about a Nancy through a trans reading and thinking about, no, but okay, so we have this character who is this um, gender non-conforming shapeshifter, you know, who can literally change their body as they need to. Um, and who is navigating a world which was not made for them, you know, that these structures are not made for them. And I think that that's extremely relevant um, for trans people, that we are living in this world, you know, in, in the Western world um, that, that has not been made for us. And so we're constantly kind of having to kind of find ways to sort of move through the world um, as safely as possible and yeah so then I kind of wanted to kind of think about kind of how can we embody this how can a Nancy be like a source of power you know that sort of this this god for the uh for those of us who have had to shapeshift who have had to hustle in some way um you know that also just very anti-capitalist just yeah I mean why why should he have to want to work like why should he have to want to be like grinding himself into the ground like yeah I don't think that's something to strive for um so yeah so I've kind of been working with with Anansi and so um I've made two paintings in the series now and so yeah the first one was um exhibited first in Stockholm and then also at the Royal Academy during the summer exhibition in 2021. And yeah, I now I've got a second one. And so it's a series that I kind of want to continue. But yeah, for me, the sort of, I guess what's at the heart of it is, yeah, just thinking about what it means to be a black trans person moving through this world. And um, yeah, just being able to sort of like reclaim these uh these stories in our heritage as well and kind of through a critical gaze and and also because I think it's really interesting this is slightly tangential but um I found out that Medusa so before working around Anansi I was also um making a comic about an Afrofuturist Medusa so this black Medusa who has uh, snakes for her 
And after working on this, I found out that um, someone told me that actually Medusa, the sort of origin of that was about a black woman. And so when you start to kind of think about these sort of these stories that we have embedded in this way, it's like, yeah, actually, where did this come from? You know, that this didn't just sort of come from, from nowhere. Um, yeah, and then I just, I think it's really beautiful kind of like thinking about spiders and thinking about like, yeah, networks and kind of like having to create our own structures. Um, and so, yeah, this is sort of, an, this is another sort of thread of um, ongoing work in my practice. I love that. I love how, you know, taking something that is so, I guess, relevant and then, yeah, I guess sort of uh, how much it's applied to your, your own experiences and sort of, you know, you mentioned about the sort of uh, symbolic, sim, symbology, symbology, that word, symbolic, mm -hmm. symbology of uh, spiders and uh, your know, experiences as a black trans person. I mean, it's just, I think that's just so interesting. I guess, um, I guess, to be honest, as a, as an aside, I don't, um, I, as a sort of uh, queer person myself, I'm just curious to ask about your experiences, again, with engaging with all of this, but through a queer lens as well. Um, yeah, I'm yeah actually, I'm really glad, yeah, I'm glad you bring that up, because um, the work that I'm doing now for the PhD, sort of a part of my process is to have like a queer trans reading of the documents. So something that I find really interesting is that there is a trend um, amongst sort of like these sort of black radical people um, to change their names as a way, you know, as a way of like in autonomy and embodiment, you know, being able to name yourself is a very like embodying act to take, ownership literally over yourself and be like you know I think for a lot of people it was like um the idea of a slave name the you know this surname where does the surname come from um and casting that out and being like no actually I'm sort of reclaiming myself and so a lot of black people have done this have changed their name um I also found it really interesting that I, I think in a lot of different black cultures um people often go by lots of different names you know like you might you might know someone by a name for years and years and find out at their funeral they had a next name which I just love this um but also you know for queer and trans people I think trans people especially um changing our name is something that is also very common and so yeah once I started looking at the archives and thinking about how um the sort of like the dead names um, of people are present in the archive. And often I've seen when historians or researchers are talking about these historical people, they'll dead name them in the process, you know. And so as a queer and trans person, I was thinking, I don't, that's not a process that I feel comfortable recreating, even if this is not um, a trans person they have reclaimed themselves under a different name. Why would I then call them by their dead name? That doesn't make any sense to me. So this has also been a part of my, um, my work, my method that actually I'm like, this is the name that this person is going by, regardless of how they're named in the archive. I know that that's not what they're called. And so I'm not gonna refer to them by their dead name. I'm not gonna kind of, um, participate in this process so yeah wherever possible I'm trying to have a queer and trans approach to reading the material to working with it um and yeah just kind of like yeah just kind of I think also it's a way of thinking about what is the world that we want to build like I often think about and have heard other people talk about um liberation for trans people is actually liberation for everybody because when we allow ourselves to live as we want to live that everybody benefits from that like we all benefit from that and so I think that's like that's also a sort of important idea to sort of embed in the work that um, these black power activists were trying to build the future that they wanted to live in and when we have that as a method, what does what does that look like then? Oh, that was, that was super interesting. 
um I think I, I guess it sort of reminded me of a conversation I had with um a friend uh, kind of a while ago about sort of the importance of uh queer people within academia and queer people of color and kind of reframing sort of uh looking at research through those specific lenses because obviously previously it's been only one group or one demographic people who are regarded as the experts who have a sort of um, objective outside opinion but really we need the multitude of experiences multitude of um, lenses to look through this media to truly engage with them in a sort of pure form I guess um, yeah I think that's absolutely super interesting um, yeah I guess like I would say that um, I'm not I'm like I don't consider myself an academic which is funny because I'm doing a PhD but I'm doing a practice-based PhD and I think of myself as an artist and that uh, it feels important for me because I'm in all of these academic spaces or in these research spaces or spaces where you know historians are um, but I'm not I'm not a historian I'm I'm not uh, a, a traditional academic I'm an artist and so um, I think it's like it also gives me a certain level of distance in some way that I don't feel so like beholden to the structures that maybe other people might need to sort of the rules that people might need to play by um, in order to sort of get forward in in their field I don't I don't necessarily feel that way because I'm, that's not my field. You know, I'm coming in as um, an interloper in some way and kind of like getting what I need out of this. Like I always say, um, I'm a chaos demon because like also as like someone, as an artist that um, has worked in schools as an artist educator, um, I'm not bound by the curriculum, you know, um, the, that guidance that I was saying about earlier um, that the government created in 2020, like as an artist, sometimes I'm able to sort of like slip under the radar and come in and have these conversations through the guise of art, you know, that actually we do talk about BLM because I'm going to do it through art. And somehow, um, sometimes when you do that, it affords you certain privileges that it wouldn't otherwise. So yeah, I think that it's like important to try and find um, a way to sort of like, yeah, just continually like navigate these, these structures and also, yeah, have like just this multiplicity of voices um, and just like, yeah, I'm just I just I think it's like I consider it like the Anansi method, you know, I'm always just like <laughs> trying to find a way. <laughs> I love that. So it's true, true reincarn you know, reincarnation of Anansi and sort of going going with the spirit of that. Um, and I, I like what you said as well about the um you kind of not engaging with texts that are dead naming people. I think there's something, you know, that spoke to me on an individual level because um a lot of um, for example, a lot of adoptees, um, when they've been adopted to, let's say, um predominantly white families, they will often change the name back afterwards to reflect the culture that they were from, because um, it's very common that they get renamed um, to have a quote unquote white name and things. And I think that's something that very much, you know, the idea about sort of, um, I mean, you know, I don't know if you've seen that movie Shang-Chi, you know, the Marvel movie from last year. Is it a Marvel movie? Yes. No. Oh, yeah. Um, and they said, I think the quote is something about names reflect who we are, where we're from, you know, all of these aspects. And I think there's something very powerful in that. Before we come to the close, I just want to ask if there's any other projects that you'd also like to highlight or anywhere that people can find, sort of engage in contact with you. Yeah, so um, one project that I was working on, I think it, yeah, basically fin uh, this finished last year in uh, 2021, but it's an ongoing project. Um, is the Black Digital Archiving Project. So, um, Along with two others, I was part of the first phase of the project um, as a researcher. And yeah, so that sort of first iteration of the project has now finished. But as I said, it's going to be something that's carrying on. And I think this is a really interesting project for people to find out about. So yeah, um, in the first stage of the project, we were just looking at where there are sort of black history collections or materials in archives across the UK. 
And so um, on the Black Digital Archiving uh, Project website, there's a map where you can see where some of these collections are across the UK, uh, in like Wales, Scotland, in different parts of England, um, and whether or not those materials are digitized. Um, it's not a like it's not a complete, uh, you know, map in some way that, you know, the, the first stage was we were looking at local history archives. And so there are inevitably going to be lots of archives and materials that are missing from map. And hopefully that's something that can be updated in like the next stage of the project. But I think that it's really interesting for people to see, even just to think about where some of those materials are in the UK in places that might be like a little bit unexpected. And hopefully that's something that people can kind of take on the mantle of uh, trying to continue doing that work. And then, yeah, people can uh, find me on Instagram. It's just my name, Rudy Lowe. Um, I'm also going to have a couple of exhibitions um, this year. So I have one work which is currently in the New Art Exchange Open Exhibition in Nottingham. And that goes on until September. And then um, in September, there's a show, a group exhibition called New Contemporaries, which is opening in Hull. And then in December, it will be on at the South London Gallery. Um, and then I'm going to have a solo exhibition in November at Staffordshire Street Studios, which is um, in London. Brilliant. So many projects coming up ahead. <laughs> always got to have like... <laughs> oh, but you just said about the spider, you know, always having networks, <laughs> different trails here and there, different chains. Uh, amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate speaking about a lot of things. I think a lot of our listeners and myself um, will learned a lot of things and I think that some of the discussions here I think that will sort of ring true as people process through them but you know thank you so much for sharing that and sharing about your experiences um yes so um thank you listeners for listening and uh we'll speak to you all in the next podcast thank you so much for having me thanks for listening if you enjoyed this episode and would like to support this podcast please share it with others and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Keep up to date with what we do at Diversifying Group at diversifying.com or follow us on social media at Diversifying Group. See you next time.